Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Thankful to see your lovely faces this morning. And, uh, Brother Ovid, although, although I can't see your face now because we closed the door, we're thankful to know that you are strong enough to, to at least be back in the parking lot this morning and, and to be present. And we thank God for that. Thank God for all of you that, that are listening to the services, watching the live stream, praying for God's grace and mercy upon us. Uh, it is a joy and a privilege to be able to bring the truth of Jesus Christ to his people. We invite you to turn with us this morning to the book of the Acts of the Apostles, the 17th chapter. No, if you give us a casual reading, it doesn't have anything to do with the birth of Christ. But I think that we will find that there are things here that we need to consider when we consider his birth. Speaking of Paul and his companions, the writer here, whom we assume to be Luke, says, Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue, of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks, a great multitude, and of the chief women, not a few. But the Jews, which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. And when they found them not, that is, Paul and his companions that had been preaching Jesus, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also, whom Jason hath received, and these all do, contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. <clears throat> Now, it should be obvious to us that except for the birth of Christ, except for the birth of Jesus, none of this would have taken place. <clears throat> and in spite of the birth of Jesus, it didn't prevent some of these things that were not good from taking place. But we need to understand here that, that first of all, we're not dealing with people that, that didn't know anything about God. We're not dealing with people that didn't know anything about the promised Messiah. As a matter of fact, we are, uh, when Paul's first stop there to the synagogue of the Jews, that was their place of worship. He had gone to church with his brethren, if you will. And while there, he took the scriptures and opened the scriptures unto them and began to teach them about Jesus, born of a virgin. It doesn't say that here, but, but you, you, you can't, you know, that's part of, the, that's part of the, the, the story that you can't leave out. And how this Jesus grew, lived among them, was crucified, and raised again from the dead, and that this is the Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. Do we understand this morning, children of God, that when we come preaching Jesus, whether it's me standing here preaching to you or whether it's you bearing his testimony to those around you by the way that you live and the way that you conduct yourself with your friends and neighbors, do we understand that we are indeed preaching the very Messiah of God 
that we are preaching God's anointed to the world around us. Do we take that seriously? Does it have a, does it impact us? Do, do you stop to consider that your words, your actions, your attitudes towards those around you Declare to them the depth of your faith in Jesus. That it's not just a religion of word, but it's a religion of action. It, it, it's a preaching of the truth in our living. Now, some of these Jews heard and believed. There were Greeks among them that heard and believed. There was a large number of sisters. You know, I, I've noticed over the years, without fail, every church that I've ever pastored, there was by, by far a greater number of sisters than there were brothers. And I look around me today and I don't see anything that's changed. Even in Paul's day, you see, it says of, of the chief women, of the women that were, were leaders in their community and leaders among the other women, there was, there was a multitude, he said, not a few. In other words, it wasn't just a small number, there was a group of them that believed. Some of them believed, and they didn't just believe, but they consorted with Paul and Silas. They hung out with Paul and Silas. They wanted to be in their company. You see, that's something that we as believers, we, we kind of drifted away, and, and I know the pandemic hasn't helped anything, but the simple fact of the matter is, we, we, were drifted, we drifted away from that before this pandemic ever came along. It is vital to God's people for their growth and their encouragement and their comfort that they make time to spend with one another, that we have time to spend in fellowship, that we have time to spend in prayer, that we have time to spend in encouragement. And we say, well, this old world we live in anymore, we just don't have that kind of time. But we got time to spend hours on Facebook. We don't take that. That's the same, sister. We don't, we make time in our lives for what we consider important in our lives. And if we just take a little stock of where we spend our time and how much time we spend in prayer, how much time we spend meditating, I, I, I know you got to work, you got to do this, you got to, I'm not saying those other things need to be left undone, but how much of your time when you're doing those other things could you spend in, at least in prayer and meditation while those other things are going on? Now, I realize sometimes you have to be careful. I was, I had about an 80 mile drive to work one way for a few years when I lived in Virginia. Most of it was down the interstate. I was going down the interstate there one morning and, and uh, knew my exit was coming up in a couple of miles and, and within that couple of miles span there were some things in the scriptures that began to, to flow to me and, and the next thing I knew I looked up and I was three towns further down the interstate than where I was supposed to have gotten off to go to work. I had to pull over and call my boss and say, I'm late and I'm going to be later. And I told him why. Thankfully, he was a man of faith. And he said, I understand. Just be careful and get here. And, and that was all that was ever said about it. But, but my point is... He, what a wonderful thing it is to, and now God had, I know the Lord was with me because I promise you this, from the time that I realized that I was about two miles from my exit to the time that I realized that I was in, 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 in states, states of North Carolina instead of Winston Salem, I couldn't tell you a thing I passed. I couldn't tell you a thing I saw. I couldn't tell you anything that happened along the way. Except that I had some wonderful communion with my Lord. For which I was thankful and, 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 and grateful that he kept me through that. 
And, I, and I'm sure each and every one of you probably can share moments like that. But the thing that we need to, that we need to do is encourage one another in those moments. We need to seek for those things. We need to desire those things. Oh, uh, and some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas. And to me, this is a part of that. We need to be involved with the people that believe in Jesus Christ. I'm not saying we need to ignore the people that don't. I'm not saying that we don't need to be kind to them. I'm not saying that we don't need to pray for them. But what I am saying is for our faith, for, for our strength, for our ability to give God praise and glory. You know, I, I love to praise Him when it's just me sitting in my corner. But I love it even more when I come and I see us sharing together in that praise. And I see it multiplied in the hearts of God's people. And I'm assured in my heart by the power of the Holy Ghost that it rises up to His throne as a sweet-smelling savor. Do you understand that in this kingdom of grace that we live in, that our prayer and our fellowship with Him is the incense that we burned before his throne. That this is what he 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 didn't he didn't ask us to burn weed, weeds of it, some description anymore. Herbs, potpourri, call it what you will, incense. He doesn't ask us to, to offer those things. What rises up to him as a sweet smelling savor is our prayers and our devotion and our faith and our love unto him. We need to keep it burning. We need to keep it rising up before his throne. But the Jews which believed not. These were God's covenant people. But they didn't believe that Jesus was the Christ. Now, they believed the Messiah would come. But see, they already had it fixed in their mind how that event was supposed to play out. And it didn't have anything to do with some little old baby being born of, of all things in a, in a stable and laid in, in, in a feed box. You know, sometimes we, we use that word manger. We don't really stop to consider what that was. Most, most of us here, I suppose, have had at least some experience with working on the farm. We know what a feed box is. They laid the king of kings and the lord of lords in a feed box. You don't get a much more humble beginning than that. And you see, these Jews that didn't believe, they weren't looking for an humble beginning. They were looking for somebody to come along and set them up in power set them up with authority and point their finger at the world and say, this is right. I fear sometimes that we lose sight of the true reason why we ought to be pursuing the truth. And rather, as those Jews did, we begin to pursue things so that we can just say to the rest of the world, see, we were right. I'm not worried about being right in the eyes of men. I'm worried about being righteous before God by His grace and mercy in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I don't have any. I can't claim any. It's not me. If there is any good thing that you have ever seen in me, it wasn't me. But my Redeemer that lives in me, that was born of a virgin, wrapped in swaddling clothes, laid in a manger, grew up to be this man that suffered and rose again from the dead. This Jesus I preach unto you is Christ. The Jews which believed not were moved with envy. They were jealous. They weren't getting any glory out of this thing. 
they weren't getting any credit or anything. They were having a hard time with that. Have you ever been jealous? Ever? And they, they not many of us that have had a, 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 at least one or two times in our life that we were jealous. Maybe over some little boy or girl. Maybe over something that somebody had that we'd like to have. Lots of things. Maybe, maybe, maybe you were jealous over a, over a promotion that somebody got that you thought should have been yours. There, there are lots of things that cause us jealousy. You know something that is bad is whenever we let that jealousy be our motivation. When jealousy becomes our motivation, we do ugly things. When jealousy becomes the force that moves us, when envy becomes the force that moves us, we forget about the things of God and we look for ways to justify ourselves and, and to, to move ourselves in, into a position of what we consider preeminence. They were moved with envy. So they went and gathered up some not real savory characters. They went out and found some folks that were willing to just tear up things for the sake of doing it. You see, we, we, we're, 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 still, we're still those same people today. There are those of a basis. I'm not saying that, <coughs> that all protests are wrong. I'm not saying that, that sometimes uh, revolution isn't necessary. If it wasn't for that, we wouldn't be the United States of America. We'd still belong to England. What I am saying is that whenever we try to elevate ourselves by destroying others, we are being moved by very base things. We are being moved out of jealousy, tearing down and pillaging and burning and hurting and destroying the lives of people that have never done anything to harm us and that have not stood to oppose us even, but have simply minded their business and stayed home. Whenever we begin, we, we, we are in exactly the same condition that now that they were in then, that on a basis sort, they gathered the company and they set the city in an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. Now Jason lived next door to the synagogue. And apparently Paul and his companions had, 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 had visited there some. Jason was apparently among the people that consorted that kept fellowship with Paul and Silas. <clears throat> so they stormed Jason's house, basically, and drew him, they, they drug him out of his house. You understand what happened here? It was, they didn't just invite him out. They drew him out. And not only him, but certain other brethren. You'll find here a few minutes that Paul and Silas weren't among them at the time. And where did they take them? To the rulers of the city. Crying, these that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. Dear saints of God, I would to God that the Spirit would so move in us and be such a power in us, God's people, in this world, that it would begin to be noised abroad of us that we were turning the world upside down. 
that we were that that we were setting everything on its ear. That we had a doctrine that was that was so unimaginable by the things of this world that it had to have an authority that was out of this world. That we had a hope and a confidence and a belief and a love that 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 strips away the things of the flesh and the things of, of, of mind, that we have a love that began before the world was. That whenever whenever the, the God, the Word, who was in the beginning with God and was God, and without Him was not anything made that was made, and the Word became flesh. He wasn't forced to be flesh. He became flesh. He wasn't coerced in the coming here. He looked upon our condition and was so filled and so moved with love that he was willing to lay aside eternal glory put on the old house of clay. Put on the tabernacle of man. And in that simple act alone, and in faith in that simple act alone, he turned the world upside down. You see, it wasn't Paul and Silas, actually, who turned the world upside down. All those that, all of those that did not believe, that was as far as they could see. But I'm going to tell you something. I'm persuaded that the believing Jews and the believing Greeks, they knew that it wasn't Paul and Silas that was turning the world upside down. It was the power of Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit that was turning the world upside down. It was setting everything they thought they knew on its ear. I, 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 there's a I love the scripture that says that, that he shook things until all that remained was what couldn't be shaken. You know, I, I'm thankful that God still, and, and, and while we would love to see this on a broad avenue, I want you to know that we still that we still have the experience of the world being turned upside down. My world was turned upside down. My world has been turned upside down a number of times. And I used to I used to dread that shaking. I used to dread those times whenever it seemed like everything was falling apart around me. Until by God's grace and mercy I finally realized that once all that shaking was over, what remained was what was good and what was lasting and what gave God honor and glory. So even though my flesh still doesn't enjoy all that shaking, I rejoice in it now because I know when he's through, what's going to be left is that which cannot be shaken. And that, you see, is what turns the world upside down, is that which cannot be shaken. People laugh at us for our faith. They have tried for over 2,000 years to put a stop to the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some terrible things have been done in the name of Jesus. But that wasn't Jesus. Some terrible things have been done to those that love and desire the name of Jesus. I read a little experience of a man, I couldn't even tell you who he is now, that got to go to China and they met a lot of high rise apartments over there, from what I understand. And they met up in some of the top floors. One of the reasons being that, that the guards that would haul them off to jail usually wouldn't go that far. And this man was, was, was visiting with and fellowshipping with and sharing the gospel with a group of about 22 people there that 
in turn, that, that were involved in sharing the truth of Jesus Christ with others. And as they were talking and fellowshipping together, he asked them, he said, What's, what happens if, if they come up here and, 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 and find us here talking about Jesus? And they said, well, you'll be deported within 24 hours and the rest of us will be in prison for six months or better. And he said, he asked, how many of you have, have actually been in prison? And of the 22, I believe it was 18 of them that raised their hand. They'd already been in prison for their faith and yet they had not... The, Everything that could be shaken had, was shaken so that that which could not be shaken remained. <clears throat> They'd already been imprisoned for, for doing what they were doing there. And you see again, that reminds me of Paul. It makes me thankful to know that, that God's grace and power is no different today. Because if you read on here, you're going to find out that, that you know, the, the brethren got Paul out of the city. They, they got Paul and Silas out because they, they knew there was going to be trouble. Now remember when Paul got there, what, what did he do? He went to the synagogue and he taught them about Jesus. So whenever it came time for Paul to leave there and, and, and he, you know, escaped out from, from the midst, he and Silas, and, and they went to the next town. And what was the first thing Paul did? You, you know, we, we'd be tempted to lay low, wouldn't we? Keep your head down, let, the, let, let things calm down a little bit. What was the first thing Paul did? Went to the synagogue in that city and started teaching them about Jesus. And there were people there that believed. And there were people where he left that heard about it and they went down there to stir up trouble. Time and time again. It's always amazed me to consider, and we, we talked about this back during the time that we were doing our Bible study in the Acts of the Apostles. How many times that Paul got up knowing that if he persisted in that way, that it was going to be hard on him. Almost beaten to death on several occasions. Stoned and left for dead. Shipwrecked. Snake bit. Now, I'm, I'm going to assure you, if you read some of Paul's letters, you, you understand that there were times that, that, that he says he was pressed out of measure. That He wasn't, he wasn't Superman. There were times that... that that despair came to him and that, that he, I'm sure there were times that he thought about giving up except that what remained couldn't be shaken and Paul was not about to surrender that which could not be shaken. Child of God I encourage you this morning don't surrender that which cannot be shaken. Hold fast to it. Put your confidence in it. Give God glory for it and live it in your lives. How important can the birth of, can we truly say the birth of Christ is to us whenever we ignore our service to him. It's easy for me to say that the Christmas story matters. But if the only time it matters is the month of December and January, I go right on back to my old way of doing and my old way of being and my old way of thinking. I'm going to tell you something. Our faith is not where it ought to be. Our trust and our confidence is not where it ought to be. And if that gets on your toes, I'll just remind you again that anything that I bring to you, I am first partaker of. So don't ever think that the preacher gets a free ticket to just get up and, 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 and step on your toes or maybe even hurt your feelings once in a while. Call you, call your attention to some things that you'd rather not think about and that he just goes on his merry way unscathed, I will assure you that before 
I ever brought to you the thought this morning of those that turned the world upside down. I had to sit down and, 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 and face those thoughts in my own life and make these considerations in my own life and understand my own failures and my shortcomings. But I'm going to tell you something, child of God, because we fail is no excuse to give up. Because we fail is no reason not to get up and, and, and go again. Without worrying about the outcome. When Paul went in that synagogue in Berea, he didn't know that if the outcome will be the same thing as it had been in Thessalonica or not. Now the scripture tells us that the Berean brethren were more noble than those in Thessalonica. But Paul didn't know that when he got there. And I said, you, 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 talk, you see what being moved with envy will do for you? The Thessalonians weren't content with, with causing an uproar in their own town. Whenever they found out that Paul was down the road teaching other folks his name, they went down there to cause an uproar again. People that envy, people that are motivated by jealousy, they are never going to be content. Don't ever expect them to leave you alone. But don't ever expect them to win either. You see, we have the authority of the Word of God that says no weapon fashioned against you will prosper. Now, we have, we have sometimes not really paid attention to uh, what that's actually saying to us. We sometimes get the feeling that bad things shouldn't happen because no weapon fashioned against us is going to prosper. He didn't say no weapon will be fashioned against you. It wasn't a promise that folks weren't going to be moved with envy against us. It wasn't a promise that we weren't going to face some trials and tribulations. It was a promise that those trials and tribulations would never overcome. That they would not prosper. No weapon fashioned against you will prosper. Those that deny the virgin birth of Jesus Christ and mock you for your belief in it, it will not prosper. Those that would lock you away from professing that you believe that Jesus is the Christ, that way will not prosper. It will not buy them what they're looking for, which is to eradicate the faith of God from the world. Because my God has said he would never leave himself without a witness. And I believe that to be the absolute truth. That as long as there are people in the world, that he will have among them a people who are steadfast in this. That this Jesus that I preach unto you is the Christ. And that we will, by God's grace and mercy, continue in some fashion, if we are faithful to that, to turn the world upside down. May God strengthen our hands to that work.